there was a line out the door, you know, trying to very, you know, open private place. I mean, imagine a country about, uh, you know, as much geography, as much ground as the U.S., but it'd be like three times as many people, or more than three times as many people, and uh, crowded out the door. And back then, at least, they didn't have a breakfast menu, so we started off where they ate in with Big Macs, fries, Cokes, and Sundays. And I'm reviewing the plan with them, you know, on the table about it. So last chance, I'm baking on the fact that no one's going to understand the speaking in Korean, because we're in Shanghai and we're speaking Chinese there. And so I'm reviewing the diagram, I'm going, here's the plan, here's the guard. And uh, the youngest of the group, he was also the biggest guy, and he was distracted, I could tell, by his first Big Mac experience. And <laughs> he wasn't paying attention. And I said, hey, what do I just say now? And I just quizzed him. And he grinned sheepishly, and he knew it had been caught. Uh, he didn't know what I was talking about. The oldest in the group, you know, the oldest girl, she slapped him you know, on the head and said, uh, you know, pay attention, this is important stuff. And I think back to that moment. What a telling moment. I mean, these are 16, 18 year olds risking everything for freedom, making that decision, you know, and we're reviewing a life and death game plan, distracted by a big man. I just remember being really upset, saying, you know, they should not be put in this situation. I remember really being upset at the North Korean regime for creating this humanitarian crisis. So much of the humanitarian crises we see in the world today are, are uh, human made. So, I said very quickly, we've got to go, we've got to run. So, we made our way over to the British Consulate, and we arrived, um, and we were taking the elevator up, and I had a hat, some hat and sunglasses on, and they giggled at me because they'd never seen me in sunglasses, and I had before. And you know, the, the in the uh, elevator, there's the camera, and I was trying to keep things light, so waving at the uh, I'm like, hey, you guys, later they're going to be looking at this footage. And I'm trying to keep things light, so I'm like, you know, wave and say hi, and I said hi, and they all started giggling, and, and I was so nervous, but I was trying to you know, keep things light. And we got upstairs to the consulate. And I noticed the guard and left it unattended, and I said, we've got to make our move now. And we uh, started to make our way over to the, uh, to, the, to the front door. And they pushed their way, one by one, they pushed their way through the door, the metal detectors that made it inside. And I, what I told them is, I said, once you get in, you're supposed to be on soft ground. But what the government will do, what the Chinese police will sometimes do, is they'll break international law by going in and trying to drag it out. And I said, if that happens, you got to bite, kick, scream, all the rules are off. You do whatever you can to make sure you don't get brought out. And you team together, you help each other. And that's exactly what happened. They got in. Chinese guards tried to drag them out. They had letters that said, you know, we're North Korean refugees seeking freedom. And the Chinese guards started dragging them out. They started fighting, screaming. And um, thinking if we had, yeah, within minutes, the lawyers reported that there was you know, 30 uniformed guards that came and stormed the place. But just in time, the British consulate workers went in and pulled them out and into safety. And I had to hurry up to make my escape. And I left them with the cell phone. And I called them on the way out. And uh, she, you know, I went out and I changed clothes into the cab and went down the street. She was probably paranoid. I was a little over yeah. when I was in the middle of the <laughs> <laughs> clothes. And, you know, made it to a payphone phone several miles down the street. I called them and, uh, and I said, they were crying. I said, what happened? What happened? Is everything okay? And they said, uh, and Teacher Kimmer, they, they came and tried to pull us out, as you said, but the British workers saved us. And I said, you have the freedom now. And I said, everything's over. All the suffering, everything you've been through, and you have the freedom. You know, I have to talk about.
interrogated, uh, all of that, right? Being able to go point and you know, crossing over, testing it out. Um, and I remember at one point when I was living in the mountains out there, navigating the, the borders and, and using the tribal people to live in the mountains to help me navigate. At one point I remember when I was testing out and hiking, you know, for hours and hours, just for days on end, hiking and testing out guns, hitting dead ends. And one tribal guy that I paid as my guide for the day to help me learn learn the mountain, he, uh, one point when we stopped, these guys are amazing, right? I can't keep up with them. I thought I was in shape and I couldn't keep up with them. And he'd go up ahead of me, and by the time I got there, he'd like, with this machete, he like, chopped out and like, made a seat for me. And then I'd like, sit down, and then he, um, he offered me something to smoke. And it's that, that moment I realized, I recalled signs back in Laos when I was testing out the routes that said, in English and multiple languages, it said, don't support the local drug trade. Don't buy opium from the locals. So at that moment, I realized, holy cow, these are drug trafficking laws we're using. <laughs> and the first thought I had was, this is pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> I had never done uh, you know, anything like this before. And the second thought I had was, uh, a more serious thought was, uh, was delighted the fact that we were redeeming these drug trafficking laws to free sex trafficking victims. And I think I've talked about this point of how to save a life. I mean, what a noble, noble endeavor, you know, to, to save lives, to, to help people. And I just encourage you, well, when I call these people I've helped now in South Korea that are there, people get the freedom, I'll call them, and a lot of times when they hear my voice, they'll recognize my voice, and they'll scream, Teacher Kim, in excitement, and they'll have to pause and wait while they cry. And uh, to wait and wait for minutes and then uh, to say, uh, thank you for saving my life. And, you know, some people might like uh, that, that kind of gratitude. It's really awkward. <laughs> um, you know, I don't, I don't know what to say. Um, but, you know, that's something we've had to deal with. Is not only have to save lives, we have to deal with how you can deal with saving lives and the after effect of all of that. And, we had a hugely rewarding time that impacted me deeply. I, the message I give to you is, you know, what, within the course of your career and your life, um, how can you serve and help other people? And I'll be talking a little bit about a service mindset later at the end that ties into some of the consulting work I'm doing now. But um, how can you serve and give to people? There was a study recently done that was featured on the front page of the Wall Street Journal that said, when you graduate college and you apply to jobs, people who serve, have served in their lives, have an advantage over people that have not. So recruiters, people that are hiring, will choose someone that has spent some time serving or volunteering in some capacity in their life, will, there's a study done by the lawyers, so look at it, it was featured in the Wall Street Journal. So think about how can I give, and you, know, you, give, you do it out of a genuine desire to help people, but it also helps you in the end. There's a return on helping others. So uh, I'll, uh, there's a book I'm reading right now called Give and Take, and the exact point of it is that um, when you look at study, the most successful people, when you compartmentalize study, the most successful people, uh, the, the trend, the characteristic is that there are people who give, givers. So fascinating, you know, give some thought. So where to lead in your career. Next slide, please. So I'm not going to tell the story, but sex trafficking I talked about, uh, it was something that you know, I encountered for the first time. It was the first time I, I, was, I come, came across what I consider the worst human rights violation in the world today, deeply impacted by my experience of being a woman, helping women, uh, you know, being sold to force every day, uh, I think is just atrocious and the worst human rights violation in, in my mind. Having experienced that, encountered that, I did this for four years. People told me, Matt, Mike, you got to write your experience in a book. And I uh, you know, finally said, you know what, I'm going to do that. I'm going to let people know about this issue so people can, can, can get involved and help. Uh, keep in mind this thought, we'll come back to the sex trafficking thing and how I tied that 
into my career, you know, the, the following career moves I made. Uh, but if we go to the next slide, please. I wrote a book and I had no idea that it got picked up by the media. So it got picked up by different international outlets, media outlets, uh, you know, you see an interview with Anderson Cooper. The, probably the largest interview I've done, the most fun one, was with a daily show with John Stewart. And so if you want to check out the clip, you, know, you, can, you can look it up. And I was, I remember being in the green room, you know, in the back, and uh, I was there, I think it was the day after Cameron Diaz. So still had Cameron Diaz's name like, on there, and he said, why came after that? And I was so nervous, and, and I was thinking, what am I doing here? Right? Like, what, what in the world? And it's amazing to me, the power of telling a story. Living a story and telling a story. Find your story. Find your journey. Find your unique journey. Live it. Live it passion. Find your passion. Go and tell that story to others. Go and write about it, blog about it. Put it on Facebook, Twitter, whatever social media network you use. Go and share about your groups and your lunches, dinners, your college friends. You know who I started crossing borders with? Uh, the organization we founded, Tom North Grants, is by college women. And all the staff that came out were my college friends. We just dream. You know how we came up with crossing borders? We were uh, uh, studying at a cafe, at Borders Cafe. It's not really around anymore, right? But yeah. Borders Cafe, and we went to the cafe. Said, oh, Borders, how's all the Borders? And that's how we came up with that name. Yeah. You know, build your relationships here, and uh, I'm fine, live your dream, tell that story, and that's what I did. And now, you know, it's, it's gone off you know, around the world, shared my story on five different continents. And next slide, please. After that, uh, Hollywood started calling and saying, is anyone turning this into a movie? Because if it's cool enough for Jon Stewart, it must be cool enough for, uh, cool enough for uh, the big screen. So then we started meeting people, and Hollywood was crazy, and I met with the producers, uh, the people who made X-Men, Lord of the Rings, and all these types of film. Uh, I couldn't believe they were interested in making the state of North Korea into a film. I mean, I was meeting with these guys. Uh, and Batman was another producer, and I met with the creator of Batman, the most recent reboots, and, and it was, felt surreal to me. And, and my motivation was always, I just want to tell my story, I want to get the story out there. I sacrificed my life for a lot of my you know, heart and effort, sacrificed the time to do this, I just want the story to be out there so more people can uh, be helped. So uh, eventually a team came alongside, and anyone recognize Guy in the Middle? Yeah, from uh, Lost to Life, I know that I don't know. Uh, so he tweets me out of nowhere. And uh, we didn't know each other. He tweets me and said, hey, Mike, I just saw a clip about you. Uh, I'd love to chat about your story and help in any way I can. So I replied, and I was like, oh, yeah, I watched Lost in China, actually. So, <laughs> yeah, so uh, I said, well, if I'm ever in Hawaii, he's shooting in Hawaii, I'm over there now. And I said, if I'm ever there, I'll, I'll you know, let's grab lunch. He said, sure. So I happened to be there for a wedding. We had lunch. And I said, Daniel, how interested are you in helping me this film? His real name is Daniel Day Chen. And he said, uh, well, let's put it this way, Mike. I tweeted you, you didn't contact me, so I'm, I'm pretty interested. <laughs> so he's since come on as a producer, and he played my role in, in the film. And he's now helping us make this. And we've, uh, it's, it's just been a, a, a crazy ride to try and get this story told on the big screen. We, you know, for example, we talked to uh, you know, some of the names I mentioned. We talked to uh, Angelina Jolie's production company. I'm a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, where she's also a member. So uh, I asked them for an introduction to her management, and they introduced me. And, uh, we've had conversations with them, writing a role for her, hoping she'll say yes. Um, and I'm trying to convince the writers to make her my love interest in the story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's not going too well. So, it's kind of crazy to think how this all evolved, you know, organically, just by living story, pursuing a passion, sacrificing, believing in, uh, telling that story, uh, and through all that, seeing what happens. So, we'll go to the next slide, please. <coughs> so, uh, well, wait. After that whole crazy intense experience, I'm, like, I'm not ready to be back in the real world. So I thought doing an MBA, which I always wanted to do, would be a good way uh, to re-enter the world, give me a little cushion for this idea I want to do. So I did my MBA at Georgetown. And after that, I went to Deloitte. And that was some of the partners. A lot of my classmates went to Deloitte. And I asked them, what, uh, I said, has anyone, you know, I'd be interested in coming to Deloitte. 
the whole consulting about the unit. So they let me come in, explore that. And uh, it's been a phenomenal ride where uh, I went into the way it started and founded and led a group that was applying technology and business solutions to the human trafficking issue. So now I'm working on two really passionate. Yeah. Thank you. 